All right, I'm Kurt Hosworth with Public Radio 90 WNMU FM. And as a part of the program called The Shuffle, this is the local spin. And I'm pleased to say my guest today is John Davey. He's been making music across the Midwest, also down south in Tennessee, and has set roots here in the Upper Peninsula and continues to make music. He's also shared his latest album called Toss Your Javelin. So, John, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. This is cool. Yeah. So your latest LP uh, refers to tossing a javelin. And of course, when I think of that, it makes me think of somebody actually tossing a javelin. But um, it also has kind of a deeper meaning, I believe, uh, giving something like your best shot, your best effort, and like aiming for your best mark. So would you call this album like your best toss of your musical javelin so far? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think so, as for just as far as like production value and stuff, um, you know, uh, personally, every, every one of the like full length albums I've made so far has sort of its own special kind of compartment internally for me. Like the first one is, um, you know, is, uh, special to me in a way that like, uh, it was the first big attempt at like actually getting, you know, getting some people together and recording a real album. And I, cause I had kind of wrestled for a long time with like, whether I was going to do just an acoustic album, which was kind of how my, my live shows were, or if I was going to flesh some more parts out with a full band and stuff. And it was kind of a laborious process and there were a lot of people involved and it took forever to do. Um, but, and accomplishing that was like a big, you know, uh, kind of milestone for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so that one, you know, the production quality isn't as high, but, um, I'm still really proud of that and some of the songs on it. Um, and then the second one was a kind of a totally different um, thing. We tracked it live really quickly in just two days. And then, um, and then you know, that was like amongst some of my closest friends uh, in Indiana. And so that one, um, I think that one sounds better. And so it's kind of a little closer to the mark. And this one um, I, I wanted to make with Shane Leonard, who whose music and um, albums that he had produced, um, I had been listening to, and I wanted him specifically to produce it because I wanted, like, I wanted something that matched the quality of the stuff I was hearing him, um, produce. And so, sure. um, so yeah, it, uh, it feels like close to that. It's sort of, um, I was saying to somebody the other day, like it, it's sort of like there, there's something in that movement too, of like reaching backwards or in order to sort of gain this kind of like momentum in order to move something forward. And um, when I moved to Marquette, I was like, sort of felt um, a little bit like disconnected from my roots for a while. And I, I went through kind of this dry spell where I wasn't writing much. Um, and my creative energy was more going into like full band, um, like working out, you know, new arrangements of old, of old material. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, when I started writing again, that's where I sort of started putting some roots down. So like, um, so the, so to answer your question, there, there are some, like, uh, some of the newer songs in the album to me now with a little bit of distance from it sound, um, incomplete, like they, they weren't finished being written almost. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that's kind of in in the spirit of the album, because it's, it's kind of like something old and then also something new at the same time. So there, yeah. there's like that balance of it. And, um, yeah, the production value on it is the highest for sure that I've ever had. And I was really pleased to work with like Shane Leonard and, um, oh no, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. All right. So my, <laughs> I just, my phone's like it's going off the battery thing here that's all right it's plugged in but something with the cord anyway that that's the long answer to your short question <laughs> <laughs> yeah well every every question has you know a different kind of answer and especially with your musical history and the people that you've collaborated with over time you've got a lot to share about either specific songs or the albums themselves uh, experiences working with different people. And I'm sure we could talk about a lot of the collaboration. And I do want to talk a bit about um, your relationship with Shane Leonard in a little bit. Um, but I also kind of wanted to talk about the what you see when you get the album. Um, first of all, you you had a successful Kickstarter for this album, which is which is awesome. Um, but on the front of the album, you have this look that you're you're kind of looking 
uh, behind you, but you're moving ahead. So it kind of speaks to what you relate to with the idea of tossing a javelin, like reaching back and then launching forward. So um, when you, you also look like you're on the move uh, when you have that, you're, you're moving forward on the, on the cover of the album. So have you ever felt restless when it comes to creativity? Like you feel like you need to keep moving, keep that momentum going, or does the process of making music help ground you? Or is it a little bit of both? Uh, I would say it's both. Um, definitely both. And they're like, those are kind of like two of maybe a handful of, of like parts of this cycle of like creative production. For me, I th I'm sure a lot of other people probably experience it like this too, but there's like, there's kind of the, the fallow period after you've sort of like created something and, and, and put it out there into the world where like you're, you just sort of need to rest and like let the, I don't know, whatever, uh, let that empty space that you've just created kind of fill up with new um, experiences. And I find in that time, I'm usually absorbing a lot of new um, well, to either just experience or reading books, listening to a lot of new music, trying to find some kind of like new connective um, uh, points, like, and just filling up that, that sort of like empty spaces, because you like recorded something, um, and it's almost like a, uh, this like flush, you know, where you get it out of yourself and, and into like a, some other form. You empty and, the cup a little bit. Yeah, and like let it live there. And so like the, the restless part, it kind of comes in between where it's like you, you fill up that container of like, you go and find new experiences and new, um, new uh, fodder, I guess. And then, um, and then yeah, that, that just naturally, when you fill up that tank, that just naturally gets pressed through the, the sieve of your, like whatever kind of uh, filter you have on. And then that, you know, if you have the impulse to create stuff in general, uh, that'll just come out in some form or another. So that that middle part, I think, is the really restless part. And, you know, like, I always kind of return to this, um, um, the Hank Williams line of like, um, I can settle down and be doing just fine when I hear that train coming down the line, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, when the Lord made me, he made a rambling man. So there, there's, there's that sort of like, uh, it, you know, that um, experience of like, uh, like, you know, hearing something from a distance and having to go look over that next ridge to see what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. And then, and then it's then like, ideally you can kind of match that hopefully with some, some like discipline of like getting actually getting in there and doing the the physical work of it of like you know singing something into a microphone and then mixing it and um putting pen to paper whatever whatever that part of the process is you know yeah um, so you're a vessel for creativity and i think that that kind of uh metaphor rings true for a lot of creatives out there where you know you've got the period of you feel full and you want to share and then once you've shared, you feel like you've got to refill the tank somehow, whether it's energy, uh, like you said, fodder for more creativity, a uh, mix of the two. And, uh, you know, that's that's an ongoing cycle. It's, it's kind of like, you know, drinking your water. You know, once once you're empty with your water, you got to make sure you get some more water in you. It's yeah. like sustenance <laughs> in a way. Yeah. And, and I think that like the grounded part that you're talking about is um, that that's sort of what you... It, that's the thing you've created and you've sort of that's now one step behind you you know so mm -hmm. I, I guess uh, there's like maybe a Fortnite metaphor in there or something <laughs> where you know how you like make bridges over over uh like over places that are not that are unexplored or something you know or yeah. across sort of chasm or whatever you're like placing down which is a, a a really strange part of that game that you just sort of get to <laughs> create in blocks your I've never played that game. I just watched my brother like, <laughs> sure. you know, you know I see that, the neon like, box right now in my mind, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you're, I, you're kind of like filling the gap and like maybe even setting a path for somebody else, uh, leaving like a little cornerstone for someone. Um, you, maybe perhaps there's also uh, yourself to go back in, in some way, you know, like, Oh yeah. Revisit. And yeah. Yeah. Maybe for other people too. Like, um, yeah, I think about that with my daughter. It's like, um, you know, 
it's like, you know, once the stuff's out there and it's sort of like people are interacting with it and stuff, it's this weird, like you, you don't have much access to that, like how people are experiencing it, at least like in the, in the internet sphere, like mm-hmm. in person, you know, you have like the, the direct feedback of people in a room if you're playing songs for people. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you can get all sorts of information like that. But um, yeah, um, but it does it does turn into something cumulatively over time. You know, it's like you have this like so I've been thinking about like my like the material that I've written and recorded is sort of is like now um that that's the sort of foundation or the ground that that's like I've you know put behind me and uh you know I think that's like a pretty human um thing to do is kind of go into uncharted unexplored unmapped territory and then build roads and bridges and power lines and stuff into that you know um and and that's sort of what I kind of think of as as like the the recorded material you're like making a path into the unknown basically it's john davies uh manifest destiny into his creative, oh, no. his creative <laughs> self <laughs> charting uncharting waters uh whether it's on on roads bridges or maybe a ship or uh while playing <laughs> fortnite <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well and speaking of making paths and traveling uh talking about some of your travels in the process of making this album, album, you traveled to Eau Claire to visit with uh, Shane Leonard and help with production, engineering, and mixing. And I have to say, just listening to some of the tracks, you know, you've got this whole different world that you, you know, people say it all the time. You you can step into a different world with this album, but uh, comparing like seeing you live and performing with like an acoustic guitar on stage. Uh, to listening to the album you've got different elements of production that are in there different kinds of instrumentation um how uh, tell us about your relationship with shane leonard and how he helped you like shape the sound and the tone of the record um yeah um so you know well it's kind of to your the first part of that like uh, i've always thought conceived of you know the there's like the composition that's its own sort of entity and like life form and then the recording of it, and um, you know that that's sort of a whole other like art form, and um, has its own sort of life because you can you can have you know a composition, but it can be expressed in basically innumerable ways. Like um, I always think of that song uh, by Cyndi Lauper, which is the time after time, oh, yeah. and and how many versions of I've heard of that it's a really solid composition. So then it can sort of, it can transmit itself into a lot of different styles and genres, even like country, rock, pop, I've heard like jazzy sort of versions of it. It can do sure. kind of any as the compositions are. Um, um, so um, yeah, I used to have like, I kind of referred to this earlier a little bit. I used to have some sort of like um, dilemma inside of me, like, oh, do, you know, do I want people to hear the songs as I normally express them, which is just me on the guitar? Um, or, or should there be some other stuff there? Is that confusing or something? But once I kind of like divided that in my mind into these are two sort of separate art forms, um, then it, it sort of made it easier to like go into the studio and not be too like wound up in my head about it of like, uh, you know, is this going to confuse people or whatever? It's just like, okay, this is a, we're using these compositions to make a different, to make it, they're tools to make a different art form, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so um, Shane, uh, Shane, I met through this guy, Scott Kirkpatrick, who goes by brother Steven. And uh, I was a big fan of his just having like played some shows around the Midwest with him. And we eventually did a, me and uh, brother Steven did a big uh, like two month long tour around the U S um, and on that tour, um, Shane uh, had heard of Scott's music and sent him some uh, tracks that he had like just recorded drums to and was like, hey, how do you like this? Here's the demo. And um, is it OK if I do some more recordings on your stuff? So Scott and I listened to those in the car while we were driving around. And um, and then uh, I met him, you know, a couple of months later and we sh- uh, shared some shows together and stuff around wisconsin indiana chicago and um 
And, uh, you know, just as my time on like being on the road all the time was kind of winding down, um, Shane was just starting to kind of get really into the production uh, stuff. And I would hear something he would record or play drums on or something. And I was into his band called Kalispell. Um, so I was just, he was just kind of on my radar and we sort of knew each other and just from sharing shows and stuff. And then, um, and then like, he kind of hit a new like level where I was like really being blown away by the, this, his output, you know, as a producer. And he would usually play on the albums too. So I, I already knew him as a, a great like guitar player, drummer, drummer primarily, but um sure. So I, I, you know, and then we, we talked a couple of times about him making the next album and, um, <clears throat> you know, I was a little hesitant to do the, the Kickstarter thing, but he sort of like, was like, you know, he had done it and a couple of people that he had produced albums for had done it. Um, so I was like, okay, well, you know, I, if, if anything, this has got to be the project to do it. Cause like, you know, um, I wanted to sort of take the um, production of the next like thing to the next level. I didn't realize he was as more in uh, demand than he was when we were sharing shows together, you know? So um, the, just the, um, I like some of the costs and stuff going into it were a little surprising, but, um, but it was cool that, that we actually reached the, the mark and that like, every, you know, I don't, to me, at least it, it felt like a win-win and I hope other people feel that same way. It, it sort of took a while to get, to get everything from point A to like the point where people are actually getting their their physical stuff right, they're holding make. on to it yeah as a product. Um, yeah um so yeah so uh shane shane being uh the producer on it we basically did it in three three main tracking sessions um and uh actually originally we were going to record it in marquette and that was the plan it was like to get him to load his car up with like some gear and come here and there's like there's this big house and with like an old chapel on it on the McClure Basin and oh. uh, the idea was to go into that chapel and just kind of camp out for a couple of days and, and track the main part of the album in there and then he would take that back to Wisconsin and, and do the overdubs there okay. uh, but it just ended up sort of being more cost effective to like for me to go there with just my guitar than him making multiple trips here with all this gear so um so i did it that way so it was like a pre-recording or like kind of like a pre-production session where i went to his place for like a couple of days stayed with his family um ate meals and stuff with them and i just played them the songs basically and then um that i thought about having on the album there were maybe 15 15 of them and then um we whittled that down to nine and um, um, yeah, uh, and we demoed some of the songs there um, just on like voice memos on our phones and he played sure. some piano stuff and drum loops. And um, so we got a little bit of the, just the structure of it recorded in that first session. And then I went back like maybe, I don't know, two or three months later and did, you know, all the guitar and vocals on it. And we did some, uh, some more, uh, overdubbing and stuff there and then it was like another probably five or six months before I went back in the summer and we went to Pine Hollow Audio and there's this guy Evan Middlesworth there who actually went to school um where I'm from at Purdue um oh, okay. and in West Lafayette so I went we went we walked into a studio and there's like Purdue paraphernalia all over and I was like what? <laughs> and, uh, nostalgia coming out here. yeah yeah it was, it was strange. And so um so we kind of I connected with that he's a really cool guy he turned like his pole barn this big pole barn into a studio with a big tracking room in there wow really comfortable control room and then the other half of it was just like his regular barn where he kept his you know lawn mowers <laughs> wow we put, we put the guitar amp uh, one guitar amp in there and he he was he called it the barno verb so it's just like uh, <laughs> you know the natural authentic barn yeah authentic barn <laughs> yeah. reverb sound <laughs> yeah so that was like what you hear on like a couple of the songs in the album uh, where the electric guitar is going but yeah um so yeah i i kind of had in my head um a little bit of what what i thought the 
the, the sound would be like. And it's pretty close to that. And there, but there were some surprises like, um, uh, Shane's idea was to have this guy, Josh Gallagher, come and play interesting key parts on some of the um, some of the songs. And that's something I'd never really had before. It was like some keys and like um, heavy, um, you know, instrumentation on some of it. So that was exciting to me to hear like that element incorporated into into some of the songs. And because um, like all my older siblings took piano lessons when I was young. And then when I was like getting out of high school and starting to play music on my own, all my younger siblings took, um, <laughs> took music lessons or piano lessons. So I started, I was yeah. like right in the spot in the middle where I, I, was, <laughs> I missed the boat when I was young. And then, and then when I was like a little bit older and getting out of the house and stuff, um, all, yeah, I missed the boat again. <laughs> all musical lessons. So I, I have a lot of like, like heard a lot of piano playing, you know, just mm -hmm. from, my family and going to church and stuff. Uh, but it was cool to have that sound, you know, then, then sort of meshed into my, in my own song. So, um, and obviously you're doing fine in your music now with, <laughs> with your instrumentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. My, yeah. Uh, yeah. All of my siblings kind of like play, uh, um, you know, marginally, uh, maybe there was something about missing the lessons, but being around for them that, <laughs> a little That's osmosis uh yeah into your brain <laughs> right yeah well i want to talk about a few of the tracks specifically um you know the the song q starts off the album and i've heard this in both both versions that we've kind of talked about as the singer songwriter on stage with the guitar version and the produced version as well but uh the song q kind of gives us a survey of your your songwriting style and the quality, but also the tone and production of the album, Toss Your Dravelin. Um, it also kind of starts us off in like a dreamlike state. You wake up in the middle of this song in the narrative, but then you kind of like question the reality around you. So does this song represent like a larger narrative to the whole album to you, or is it kind of a world of its own? Um, I, um, I think, yeah, I think it's sort of both. Um, I, I was, I sort of had a different idea um, for the like the sequencing of the tracks in the album but um uh, i wanted it to start with the song lower tears which ends up being the second track but then shane um suggested he he was um we kind of talked a little bit about about the sequencing and stuff but he was really excited about the production on that one in particular which i think does a good job of like embodying the collaboration between us where it's like you, it's some of those sort of like dreamy kind of soundscapes mm -hmm. um, incorporated into into that song, which is like the it's kind of like an A B C format rather than an A B A B C D A part thing, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of standard the standard pop song structure. But um, so I, I like that. That's what I I sort of see myself as doing a lot is like taking. Um, normal or, or, or uh, common forms and sort of taking them apart and place playing with the different like um sections of them that's what oh, i yeah. that's what i like about the songwriting process is just playing with different uh the different parts um so he suggested that as being the first one so then i listened to the album in that in that sequence and i thought it was a really good start for it and yeah um that um that was like that song was like the first song that I wrote sort of coming out of this law, this drought of songwriting where like, um, I felt like I kind of didn't have a, like a, like a home center, you know, cause I just moved here. And then I just like a year before that moved from my hometown where I lived my whole life. Um, so it was sort of like two levels of, of, uh, separation away from like my roots, you know? Oh yeah. And I, and then when I kind of started putting down roots here in Michigan, then that process started over, you know, and like mm -hmm. songs started coming out of that. And that was like the first one basically. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that is a good embodiment. Um, it is sort of about a super hyper-specific like uh, series of events in my personal life, but I think within the context of the album, it works like um, as a sort of saying something about the spirit of the album and also 
Um, yeah, I, I guess that's enough enough to say about it. <laughs> sure, sure. And I think it's a great way to start. Like you said, it it kind of gives you an entry point into this a uh, little bit of a dreamscape uh, version of some of your songs. Um, and again, I've had the, the opportunity to hear you sing with an acoustic guitar and nothing else a few times now. Um, so it's cool to hear the difference between those two. Now, you also recorded a video uh, for us uh, for the song Sugar Mask that also tells a story. And it, it tells a story of different people. One of them is named John who's going through, it sounds like problems of fidelity. Um, is this a, a song from personal experience or did you also craft some characters in the songwriting process? Um, it's a little bit of both. Uh, and like, um, yeah, that, that's so, um, like I was saying, like the, this album is sort of half, it's sort of like dichotomous. Um, there's, I don't even know if that's actually a word or not. But, it sounds about uh, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, half of it is like songs from what almost feels like I don't know. I mean, I'm still connected to it in some ways, but almost feels like a, a past life, you know, mm -hmm. and then the, then this like new, uh, life. So it's like, um, half the songs on it are older. That's one of the older ones. Um, yeah, I, I went through sort of like a series of like, um, <laughs> a series of failed relationships and, um, in, you know, probably five, or six years ago. And, uh, you know, the first couple of times it happened, like, it was like, man, uh, <laughs> like, uh, these people that I'm, they're like, they must, there must be something wrong with them or something. <laughs> and then <laughs> at a certain point it's, it, it occurred to me, I was like, oh, this same, it's like similar things kind of keep happening with, um, these, uh, situations I find myself in and, and like, maybe, maybe the problem is, is with me, you know? And so, yeah, there's, um, and the, um, and, and then, there it also the song also makes reference to somebody named harlan um which is um sort of my little hat tip to harlan howard who's who's a um uh, songwriter a songwriter who coined the phrase three chords and the truth if you've ever heard that um, yeah. described i i always thought that phrase uh, was referring to punk music for some reason um <laughs> But actually, then I learned it, it, it. Harlan Howard came up with that, and he's he's referring to country music as three chords and the truth. Um, and I was like really getting deep into like into the country music thing, and 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 like um, there's that element of like country songs that are sort of like you know there's like the drinking songs, there's the um, the cheating songs, and the um, you know, love songs. And there's sort of like these like classic compartments of, of um, country music and that mm -hmm. sort of, I don't know if that's a country song, but I was definitely listen to, listening to a lot, a lot of that at the time. And sort of like some of it was mirroring my own personal experiences. And so, um, yeah, um, Sugar Mask, it, like uh, I had this image in my head for a long time because I like years ago, probably in like 2008 or something, I stayed at this, um, this guy's place in, in Kansas city. And, uh, he had a, it's like, there was like a blow up mattress in there and, um, and, uh, maybe like a, a pile of like books and then nothing else in the room except for this one black and white picture just taped to, to the wall in this guest bedroom. Wow. And, um, <laughs> And so I, I like stayed in, the, in his in that guest bedroom that night, and all there was to look at really was just this picture on the wall, and it's just like uh, a girl with a um, one of those um, like dia uh, what do they call those the Day of the Dead like oh, mask you know? right right yeah uh, and uh, and so that picture just like stuck in my head for a long time. So then for some reason um, that kind of like became when I would kind of go back to that picture it would it became sort of this entryway to like some of the concepts in that song that ended up sort of expressing themselves and that's one that I had for like a long like sometimes songs happen in like 15 minutes and you write them and then other times you're like laboring over them for forever right. until <laughs> something finally clicks or maybe it never never does um but that was one where I had I had kind of the main part of it for like two years 
and I'd keep coming back to it. I'm like, I think there's something here. And then, but it's like missing something. And then eventually I, I wrote the bridge to it, which was part of another song. Mm-hmm. And it, it, there was some, some union there. And that so that's together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I would like try to play that song at shows and stuff and never really got a particularly good response, but I believed in it. You know, I was like, ah, so oh, I yeah. gotta, I gotta, I this gotta. It's like my underdog song kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which is kind of why it's like the one I'm promoting after the release of everything. Cause it's like, I, I, I want this song to be, you know, like I want, I want people moment. to know this song just cause I, I believe in it, but um mm-hmm. So it wasn't the first choice for like a single or anything, but I think it turned out nice in the album because it has a lot, like it has the kind of live um, sounding um, uh, uh, track, live tracking sound to it. And also some of the components that make up the rest of the album. Like there's like some nice organ sound stuff going on in it. And Mm -hmm. I play a, a solo in it, which is something I've never really done before on a recording. So um i'm i'm proud i'm proud of that song I, um yeah i hope people listen to it and like it excellent well we're gonna share that uh kind of at the tail end of this video you know once we get everything all all wrapped up so it'll have a moment to shine here and also on the album itself too so uh thanks for believing in that song and you know pushing it through that's excellent um, I have one more song I want to just touch base on is another one that you kind of released as a single on its own. It has a kind of an eerie look to it with you in a different pose uh, than you are on the cover. And you also have a mask on, it looks like. But the song itself, Hard Times, Strong Men, has like a cyclical quality in it, um, talking about the way of life, uh, struggling through hardships and then eventual celebrations. Um, but it also transforms through different instrumentation as we've kind of talked about on the album. Do you consider this song like an observation of humanity's ebb and flow between conflict and peace? Uh, do you see it as like a cautionary tale or something different? Um, yes. Um, yeah, that one, I'm still kind of like trying to unpack myself, but I, I did go into that um, after I sort of arrived at the the melody, which is kind of like... Um, sort of like a shout out to like George Harrison and um, uh, uh, Ravi, uh, what's his name? Um, um, uh, the guy who plays the sitar. Oh, Ravi Shankar. Ravi Shankar, um, their sort of collaborations. We, we watched that, um, that, doc, that George Harrison documentary. I forget what it's called, but it was really good. Um, so I was like, you know, sort of like doing these like Indian chants uh, to myself in our apartment for a while. And that, that one sort of like, kind of kept coming up and then I like figured out what it was in the guitar and then like was just playing that repetitively so first of all that that repetitive thing came initially from the from the melody you know like Mm. that's that's the sort of that's the tune the the center of the song the crux of it yes Mm -hmm. and then everything else sort of like swirling around that like like in mecca you know where everybody goes around the the cube there yeah in in the (laughs) circle thing there's something like religious to it so i I did go into like into that song thinking trying attempting to do like make something that was um archetypal you know it's like okay i'm gonna try i'm gonna try to sort of like express something about some yeah something about like um um you're saying um um human I forget exactly how you put it, but I thought it was a good way. Kind of humanity's ebb and flow and like this constant cycle of uh, conflict and peace that we always seem to find ourselves in. Um, Yeah. There's a, there's a, an an adage that's, that is basically the last part of the song that I've heard about, like the rise and fall of civilizations, you know, um, is hard times make strong men, strong men make uh, uh, good times, good times make soft men, soft men make hard times. So that there is that cyclical thing. But those two things are the, you know, those that's that's the center of the song is like that repetitious um, thing where it, at least it looks like, it looks like history repeats itself. I don't know if it actually does or not, but that's, <laughs> I guess maybe a question for a different podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or we'll check in again in maybe 20 or 30 years too and see <laughs> where we're at. <laughs> right, right. The ongoing saga of uh, John Davies, 
uh, cosmic adventures, <laughs> <laughs> cosmic Fortnite adventures. <laughs> I don't know why I just keep having to bring it back to that. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. John, John Davey here with me. Uh, we're talking about his album, Toss Your Javelin. And uh, a little bit later on, we'll have that video of John's performance of Sugar Mask. But is there anything that you want to leave our listeners and viewers with any term ever we have viewers too um about the album or about any of the songs um oh shoot so um yeah i, I mean i i just i like uh i just hope i just hope people uh hear it and like can um find something in it that that resonates um it was released like in september of last year like the full album um, so I'm, I'm kind of doing a tail, uh, tailwind, um, trying to, uh, promote it, you know, and in, in various ways, um, uh, it's, it's hard to like condense something about any particular, a uh, song on there. I'm proud of the whole thing. Um, some of it sounds incomplete to me, but I just hope people will like it and listen, listen to it. That's, that's all. Um, okay. yeah. Awesome. Well, and you know, with the feeling of like uh, incompleteness that like we talked about with creativity, you know, if you have something that pulls you back into it or pulls you forward uh, with more of that creativity, trying to fill that cup again, well, it sounds like you're, you're doing the right thing with creativity. If you're not like giving every single thing right away, you've got something else to aspire to as well. Yeah. And, and I guess the, the aspiration for me for this album is like, maybe, maybe this will be, uh, you know, in somebody else's, um, if the timing's right for somebody else, maybe this will be something that I'm, you know, pouring into somebody else's, um, sort of fallow, uh, state where they can find something there that will, uh, that they can ingest and then, um, find find its way out into the world through through their own you know personal filter sure. um that that's the that's the highest aspiration i guess for for this album yeah well you've done your part for sure by recording and performing this uh this album toss your javelin again with john davy here so now it's on you everyone out there take a listen uh and uh take a watch of the video of his performance of sugar mask as well but john thank you so much for joining us here on the local spin it's been great to talk with you today yeah it's been great to talk to you too kurt let's uh let's see each other after uh the masks uh masks are able to come off so hopefully in, in the not too distant future absolutely yeah and then otherwise i'll meet you in 20 years <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks Thank again. You. This is a song called Sugar Mask. Amy's bones protrude. She is lying in the Smoking a faint scent of perfume in the early
in the early afternoon. Mm.